Chapter 7 of Parables from Nature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. Parables from Nature by Margaret Gaddy. Chapter 7 Waiting. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait lamentations three twenty six it was doubtless a very sorry life the house cricket led before houses were built and fires were kindled there was no comfortable kitchen hearth then in the warm nooks and corners from which he might sit and sing his cheerful song coming out every now and then to bask himself in the glow of the blazing light on the contrary he so fond of heat had no place to shelter in but holes in hollow trees or crevices in rocks and stones or some equally dull and damp abode besides which he had to bear the incessant taunts and ridicule of creatures who were perfectly comfortable themselves and so had no fellow-feeling for his want of cheerfulness why don't you go and spring about and sing in the fields with your cousin the grasshopper was the ill-natured question of the spider as she twisted her web in one of the refuge holes the cricket had crept into i'm sure your legs are long enough if you would only take the trouble to undouble them it's nothing but a sulky discontented feeling that keeps you and your family moping in these out-of-the-way corners when you ought to be using your limbs in jumping about and enjoying yourself and i dare say too that you could sing a great deal louder if you chose the cricket thought perhaps he could but he must feel very differently to what he did then before it would be possible to try something was so very very wrong with him but what that something was he did not know all the other beasts and birds and insects seemed easy and happy enough the spider for instance was quite at home and gay in the hole he found so dismal and it was not the spider only who was contented the flies the bees the ants the very mole who sometimes came up from burrowing and told wonderful stories of his underground delights the birds and their merry songs the huge beasts who walked about like giants in the fields all all were satisfied with their condition and happy in themselves every one had the home he liked and no one envied the other but with him it was quite otherwise he never felt at home on the contrary it always seemed to him that he was looking out for something that was not there some place that could never be found some state where he could rise out of the depression and uneasiness which here seemed to clog him down though he could not understand why poor fellow as things were now he felt forever driven to hide in holes although he knew that his limbs were built for energy and few ever heard his voice though he possessed one fitted for something much better than doleful complaints sometimes a set of house crickets would meet and talk the matter over they looked at their long folded-up legs and could not but see how exactly they were like those of the grasshopper and yet the idea of following the grasshopper into the cool grass and jumping about all day was odious to them once indeed a cricket of great self-denial offered to go into the fields and find one of his green cousins and ask his opinion on the subject and whether he could give any reason why the grasshopper life should be so distasteful to such near relations and he actually went and when the grasshopper could be persuaded to stand quiet for a few seconds and listen he was so much concerned for the crickets for he had a tender heart 
from living so much in the grass and being so musical that he said he would himself visit his cousins and see what could be done for them perhaps it was some little accidental ailment or it might be a chronic affection in the family maybe owing to mismanagement when they were young but which a little judicious treatment would correct with these views he started for the hollow tree in which the crickets had taken shelter and soon reached it for he travelled the whole way in bounds and the last bound took him fairly into the midst of the family circle in which indeed he alighted with more vivacity than politeness for his cousins did not like such startling gaiety however he studied himself carefully and then began to examine the legs and knees of all the crickets assembled he drew them out and looked them well over for thought he there is perhaps some blunder or flaw in the way the joints are put together but he could find nothing amiss there sat the crickets with legs and bodies as nicely made as his own only with no energy for exertion what he might have thought or what he might have said after this puzzling discovery no one can tell for at the end of his examination he was seized with the fidgets and excuse me my dear friends cried he i have the cramp in my left leg i must jump and jump he did once twice thrice and the last jump carried him out of the tree and either on purpose or from forgetfulness he sprang singing away and returned to his cousins the crickets no more oh this yearning after some other better state that lies unrevealed in the indefinite future how restless and disheartening a sensation oh this painful contrast of perfection in all created things around to the lonely meditator on so much happiness who is the solitary exception to the rule how trying the position how cruel how almost overwhelming the struggle between the iron chain of reality and the soaring wing of aspiration but what is the use my poor good friends expostulated a plodding old mole one day after coming out to see how the upper world went on and hearing the cricket's complaints what is the use of all this groaning and conjecturing you admit that every other creature but yourself is perfect in its way and quite happy well then i will tell you that you ought to be quite sure you are perfect in your way too though you have not found it out yet and that you will be happy one day or other although it may not be the case just now do you suppose this fine scheme of things we live in is to be soiled with one speck of dirt as it were for the sake of teasing such a little insignificant creature as yourself don't think it for a moment for it is not at all likely but you must not suppose that everything goes right at first even with the best of us i have had some small experience and i know but everything fits in at last of that i am quite sure for instance now i do not suppose it ever occurred to you to think what a trial it must be to a young mole when he first begins to burrow in the earth do you imagine that he knows what he is doing it for or what will be the result no such thing it is a complete working in the dark not knowing in the least where he is going dear me if one had once stopped to conjecture and puzzle what a hardship it would have seemed to drive one's nose by the hour together into unknown ground for some unexplained reason that did not come out for some time afterwards and that one had no certainty would ever come out at all but everything fits in at last and so it did with us i remember it quite well in my own case we drove the earth away and outwards till the space so cleared 
proved an absolute palace. By the by, I must try and get you down into our splendid abode. It will cheer you up and teach you a useful lesson. Well, so you see, we found out at last what all the grubbing had been for. Ah, but, interrupted the cricket, you were laboring for some purpose all the time, and if I had to labor, I could hope. The difficulty is to sit moping with nothing to do but wait. It is nonsense to talk of nothing to do, answered the mole. Every creature has something to do. You, for instance, have always to watch for the sun. You know you like the beams and warmth he sends out better than anything else in the world, so you should get into the way of them as much as you can. And after the sun is set, you must hunt up the snuggest holes you can find, and so make the best of things as they are. And for the rest, you must wait. And waiting answers sometimes as well as working. I can assure you, there was the young ox in the plains near here. As soon as he could run about at all, he began driving his clumsy head against everything he met. Footnote. The bull-calf butts with smooth and unarmed brow, and no reassurance common to a whole species does in any instance prove delusive. Coleridge's aids to reflection. No one could tell why, but he fidgeted and butted about all day long, and many of his friends and acquaintances were very much offended by his manners. Others laughed. The dogs, indeed, were particularly amused, and used to bark at him constantly, even close to his nose sometimes, as he lowered his head after them. Well, at last, out came the secret. Two fine horns grew out from our friend's head, and people soon understood the meaning of all the budding, and one of the saucy curs who was playing the old barking game with him one day got finally tossed for his pains. Everything fits in at last, my friends. No cravings are given in vain. There is always something in store to account for them. You may be quite sure. You may have to wait a bit. Some of you a shorter, some a longer time. But do wait, and everything will fit in and be perfect at last. It was a most fortunate circumstance for the crickets that the mole happened to give them this good advice, for a malicious ape had lately been suggesting to them whether, as they were totally useless and very unhappy, it would not be a good thing for them all to starve themselves to death, or in some other way to rid the world of their whole race. But the mole's good sense gave a different turn to their ideas, and hope is so natural and pleasant a feeling that when once they ventured to encourage it, it flourished and grew in their hearts till it created a sort of happiness of itself. In short, they determined to wait and meantime to watch for the sun as their friend had advised. There are not many records of the early history of the house crickets, but it is supposed that they traveled about a good deal, preferring always the hottest countries, and rumors of a few straggling families who had discovered a sort of cricket elysium at the mouth of volcanoes were afloat at one time. But the truth of the report was never ascertained, and as doubtless, if ever they got there, they were sure to be swept away to destruction by the first eruption that took place. It is no wonder that the fact has never been thoroughly established. Meanwhile, several generations died off, and things remained much as they were. But the words of the mole were carried down from father to son, and became a byword of comfort among them. Everything would fit in at last. No cravings are given in vain. There is always something in store to account for them. Wait, and everything will fit in and be perfect at last. 
Gleams of hope, indeed, were not wanting to our poor little friends during this time of probation. Wherever fires were kindled by human hands, whether by wanderers in the depths of forests or sojourners in tents, a stir of excitement and rapturous expectation was caused among such crickets as were near enough to know and enjoy the circumstance. But alas, when the travelers journeyed onwards, or the tents were removed elsewhere, the disappointment that ensued was bitter in proportion. Many an evil hint, too, had they on such occasions from the mischief-making creatures which are to be found in all grades of life, that such, and no better, would be their fate for ever. Rays of joy, beaming only to be extinguished in cruel mockery of their feelings, such was to be their perpetual portion. But we will not believe it, cried the crickets, heartbroken as they were. Everything will be perfect at last, sang they as loudly as they could. No cravings are given in vain, and as they always sang this same song, the mischief-makers got tired of listening at last, and left them to sing and weep alone. Ah, it required no small strength of mind to resist, as they did, such plausible insinuations, supported as they were by present appearances. But truly, though it tarried, the day of deliverance and joy did come. The first fire that ever warmed the hearthstone that flagged the grand old chimney arch of ancient times ended forever the mystery of the house cricket's wants and cravings, and when it commonly blazed every winter night in men's dwellings, all the doubts and woes of cricket life were over. These seem to have passed away like the dreams of a disturbed night, which had been succeeded by daylight and reality. And oh, what ecstasy of joy the crickets felt! How loud they shouted, and how high they sprang! We knew it would be so. The good old mole was right. The grumbling beasts were wrong. Everything is perfect now, and no one is so happy as we are. Grandmother, what creature is it that I hear singing so loudly in the corner by the fire? inquires the little one of the good old dame who sits musing on the oaken settle. I do not hear it, my child, and I do not know, answers the deaf and blind old crone. But if it be singing love, it is happy, and enjoys these blessed fires as much as I do. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Ah, it was no wonder that amidst the many merry voices that then shouted and still shout round those warm and friendly fires, no voice is louder, no joy more grateful than that of the patient cricket. He has waited through fear and shadows, has hoped through darkness and ignorance, and his abode now glows with warmth and light. And if he received a lesson of wisdom from a creature more humble and seemingly more blind than himself, it is at least not the only instance in which instruction has been so obtained. And now we know the reason why the crickets come by troops into our houses and live and thrive about our cheering fires, and sing so loud and long that the housewives sometimes, I grieve to say, get weary of the noise and try to lessen the number of their lively visitors. But yet there is a strange old notion of good fortune attending the presence of these little chirping creatures. They are welcomed as bringing good luck to the family about whose hearth they settle and so they do they bring with them a tale of promises made good they sing a song of hope fulfilled and though in that glad music there be neither speech nor language which we can recognize as such 
there is yet a voice to be heard among them by all who love to listen with reverent delight to the sweet harmonies and deep analogies of nature end of waiting recording by bill mosley bernardo texas u s a